Okay, welcome to the 23rd Virtual History of 2021, presented by the Baltimore Architecture Foundation and Baltimore Heritage. This is Nathan Dennis, the Associate Director of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. Thank you to everyone who donated to be with us today. Your support allows us to host these uh, virtual histories every week. We've now done, I think, since we started in April of 2020, about 56 of them. Um, and we're going to keep on doing them as long as people are interested in them. And before we get started, speaking of upcoming presentations, uh, on July 9th, we'll be um, exploring Historic Dundalk, which is part of our ongoing um, series related to Olmsted Parks and Landscapes. And next week, with the 4th of July weekend, we will be off. So um, skip a week next week and join us again on July 9th. And uh, moving on to today's presentation about the Pratt Central Library. Introducing today's speakers is Gordon Crabby. COO of the Enoch Pratt Free Library, where he has worked since 1989. He oversees the financial management, human resources, facility management, and information technology departments through four department heads. Gordon, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Nathan. Uh, I'm glad to be here today and participate in this uh, event. And uh, my job is pretty simple in terms of introducing our presenters today. And uh, our first presenter, Jillian Storms, uh, has performed extensive historical research uh, on numerous architects, including Clyde Frizz, the first to receive an architectural license issued in Maryland and one of the original architects of the Pratt Central Library which is located at 400 Cathedral Street. Um, Jillian is a former president of the Baltimore Architectural Foundation and now co-chairs its research committee, the Dead Architects Society. She serves as an architect with the School Facilities Branch of the Maryland State Department of Education. Um, our second presenter is someone I've known since um, shortly after I joined the library and uh, I just um, have enjoyed working with Sandra over the years. She's just uh, wonderfully skilled, uh, an even nicer person and someone I uh, consider a friend. Um, so uh, Sandra is a uh, founding principal of uh, the Sandra Vicchio and Associates uh, with more than 30 years of experience in programming, planning, architecture and design. Her portfolio includes historic preservation, renovation, and new construction encompassing laboratory, office, administration, uh, administrative visitor center, library, and museum space, spaces. Um, she's co-authored a book, The Live, Living Library, an Intellectual Ecosystem, and served as consulting architect on the Pratt Central Library Renovation Project Team, along with lead architects Bayer Blinder Bell and managing architects, Air St. Grace. And um, this has been really one of the great experiences of my career working uh, on this project. And uh, that's really uh, in part due to the great collaboration I've had with Sandra and uh, it's been a pleasure working with her. So those are my introductions and I'm just happy to be here uh, to participate in this program. I guess I'd turn it over to Jillian. <laughs> Next slide. Hello, everybody can hear me well? Okay, good, you can hear me. Um, yes, so uh, I am just so delighted uh, to be able to present today. Um, I've uh, loved the library building um, for all the time I've lived here. Um, and I particularly got more involved in when I started to study the architect Clyde Frizz and who was one of the architects on this library. Um, but the, uh, the library itself was a wonderful gift to um, the city of Baltimore um, because it was uh, money that uh, dry goods sales, a merchant uh, in Oak Pratt had decided he wanted to have a municipal lending library. He wanted the population of the city to be educated. And in fact, he wanted it to be for all people, rich and poor, without distinction of race and color. So this was actually quite, <laughs> quite a move in that day. Um, and, and in fact, it, when it opened in 1886, it became very popular 
And with the population in the city just tripling um, as you, uh, the turn of the century, it, it became so used. I think they said in 1927, um, there was a 65% increase in just the usage of books. So it was quickly outgrowing its capacity um, and it was located on Mulberry Street. So they had bought up several buildings next to it. And then they decided um, that they really actually needed a much larger library for the city. And um, uh, Dr. Bernard Steiner, who had been a li the librarian for the last 35 years, he managed to get it into the works to um, buy the piece of land that uh, where it sits now. And I wanted to show you pointing out circle, circled is um, Wheeler, uh, Joseph Wheeler, who became the director after um, um, uh, Dr. Steiner died, unfortunately, in 1927. And um, they managed to pass in May of 1927, the Baltimore voters approved by a margin of three to one, a $3 million loan to build the library. Next slide, please. That was a groundbreaking, that image. Um, and so Wheeler was just an incredible, incredible man. He wanted to make the best library ever. He, um, he, he wrote uh, librarians all over the country. He went to several conferences, brought plans. He, here, I have pointed out several things that are in the collection. And I, I also want to give a good shout out to um, the library archives that have kept a lot of these records and allowed me to um, read through them. Um, but uh, Wheeler had this article on humanizing a library building, which he sent to all the board of trustees. And it was all about how to make libraries more for the people. And, and a lot of things in, during that day, Beaux-Arts, you know, they were up on plinths, so, you know, you had to walk up these grand stairs. Uh, and then when you got inside, there's even another set of grand stairs to walk up to yet a second floor that you had this grand reading room. And, but it was all sort of lofty. And his feeling is that people, the common man would feel put off from the start. And uh, he, you can see in this um, annual report to the trustees, he titles it a great library in the making. And he wrote in the newspapers about what the public could expect to see. And I, I wanted to point out um, one of the things that came quickly to fold is this image in the bottom. Uh, it, it's a, a library in Grand Rapids. It, unlike all the other libraries being done, it was the first to put the library down at the street level at the sidewalk. And this really struck Wheeler as the way to go. Um, and then on the image above, I wanted to point out that he, I mean, he was just, he must have really run the architects ragged because it says that um, because of the legal delays they had, they had four years of constant change and development of the plans. They had 25 successive set of preliminary floor plans and um, exterior elevations that were discarded to finally come with what we have today. Next slide, please. So, um, they, in, in 1928, um, in May, uh, the uh, Architectural Review Board, um, or I don't actually, I'm not sure they're called that, that but they, there was a, a governing body that uh, approved large commissions for public buildings. And um, they voted, it was a split vote, they voted for the local architect of Clyde and Frizz. And, his son was associated with him, but a lot of the correspondence is to Clyde himself. But, um, and, and they were, but it was split and it was a lot very controversial in the paper at the time. Um, I think that there were other architects that they were looking at, um, uh, especially the firm that actually he left to start his own firm, um, which was um, Taylor, um, uh, well anyway, okay, it, it, it's, it, it, Spiri was another person was floated. But he actually had been working with the library, uh, you know, at least for four months before this, because as soon as Wheeler had gotten the go ahead that they were going to even do this, he was out contacting, um, finding out, he, he wrote the American Library Association, what's the best library, uh, library designers that are out there? And they named several. Um, he got Frizz's name from a local realtor who highly recommended because he had questions about 
how, you know, how do you do mechanical systems? How do you do library? Wheeler was always full of questions to everybody. Well, these are the projects that uh, Clyde had at the time. Um, I think you will recognize in the upper right, um, the, uh, it's now owned by the UB building. Um, uh, but, but I mean, you would be, uh, the UB Center, that, that it, and that was a drawing by Frizz to, uh, of it um, to the left. But below it is the Home Friendly Insurance Building, which was just created. And I think that really interested Wheeler. It had a lot of um, first floor show windows. Um, but also the Standard Oil Building was uh, quite a remarkable building at that time. It was a, it was a high rise. And so um, he, 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 I think Wheeler felt confident that Frizz would know how to handle um, the library. I just wanted to point out this other little building is also a UB building, but it's been reclad. That was one of the first buildings that he did when he uh, started out on his, uh, with, with a firm, when he left the firm he came, when he started out, um, Beecher, Frizz, and Greg, but he didn't stick with them. Next, next slide, sorry. It's very interesting because the firm that was unanimous, that, they, 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 that, that everybody wanted was, um, Tilton and Giffens. They had done, at, by that point, over 100 libraries throughout the U.S. However, none were quite as large as the Pratt Library was going to be. And so there's letters uh, in the um, archives where he's writing Wheeler saying, hey, we got this one in Virginia and it's a, it's a million, you know, like trying to make sure that he knew we can handle this. And um, as you can see, though, uh, his, the work was quite prestigious. And they had just finished up one for Johns Hopkins, their Welsh Medical Library. They also had done one in DC a few years earlier. So they were known. I, I wanna point out the one to the lower right, which is uh, in Highland Park, which is getting to be like at street grade. And, and I think that that probably very much interested Wheeler. Next slide, please. So in the early designs, um, Wheeler has shared what he thought the primary task of the architects would be. Um, he wanted them to build a monumental building whose exterior should be imposing, dignified, and appropriate. He really wanted it to be beautiful, but well-proportioned. And there's lots of writing back and forth between him and the architects going, ah, that doesn't seem like that's a good proportion. Do we break the archway you know, here? Or you know, do we raise the base up to there? He really didn't want to appear aloof. He wanted it to be something that people could approach. So the first, the first elevation that uh, drawing was the one by Tilton up above. And I'm glad they didn't go that direction because it kind of looks like the courthouse. Um, but you could see how on the lower one, um, which came several, uh, we don't have a date on the upper one, but we know that the one lower um, was after they sort of trying to clean up the facade. Next slide. I Uh, I wanted to point out in the upper left, that was also an early image. Um, it just fit better on this slide, but you can see it, it had a whole different feel. But they, they, they settled on trying to create this entrance in the center. And then it was just a matter of how simplified the elements were going to be that went along the whole storefront. Wheeler was very, very strong on the fact that it needed to have show windows where people could look in, see people in the library, could see also things being displayed, and that you had a, you, you clearly knew where the entrance was. I point out this little drawing on the upper right, which I believe was done by Clyde Frizz. Originally, Wheeler thought Frizz would be doing the, the elevations and, and Wheeler uh, and Tilden and Gissings would only be doing the um, floor plans. But Giffen's kept sending, you know, sending um, drawings. And so they ended up being the ones that I think got the most response. Um, and what a lot of what uh, Clyde Frizz and his son did was try to detail everything and make sure that it was appropriate. And the one they ended up with at the lower left was the image that went into the newspaper. And it pretty much you can see is what they, which they actually did um, complete. Next slide, please. What I think what's really striking more than its monumentality though is, is the way that it makes those windows like jewel boxes. These wonderful, um, that, that there's, oh, it animates that facade like none other. 
and really people were just struck by it when it opened. And you can also see that same element repeating in the entrance way. So you, you actually have an entrance within an entrance within an entrance. So you're bringing that scale down so people can feel like they can enter and it's not too overwhelming. Next slide, please. So one of the things that happened though is what we alluded to before, there was legal holdups. They basically owned the property that the library was on and several buildings next to it, but the other land they had to buy up. And um, it, at first it was actually being bought up by a business that was gonna take over part of it. And they had to sort of end up getting that from them at cost. But there were a couple of holdouts and it, it grinded its way through the court until they finally uh, achieved the whole site. But in that process, a couple of things happened. Uh, one, they got to do, <laughs> it got to really refine the design so it, it, it got to fit like a glove to exactly what they wanted. And the other thing is the depression hit. And so suddenly you could actually buy a lot of skilled labor, labor for less cost. So um, you can see in, in 19, um, the cornerstone was laid in 1932. Next slide, please. And it, and it, it took, so it, it went up fairly quickly. Um, you can see the uh, steel frame. Um, one of the things that was very interesting is that you can see the floor plans on the upper left. You can, you can see how it's a structural system. Well, below it had three floors of stacks below, which was uh, something that we really, really wanted to do, which was not overcrowd the library with too many books, but have enough books. But the, the stacks themselves below are structure. You didn't, they didn't want to take up even big columns below. And so um, it, it was a very novel system that actually uh, Tilton and Giffins had used on a prior library. Next slide, please. So one of the things it was to try to create a real openness, welcoming, knowable, flexible. And Wheeler had the architects do that in several ways. One, have sight lines all the way through the building. Don't create rooms, instead create separations with, with books, but not, not actually having walls. He also felt that that would be flexible when certain kind, they split up the first floor so that they had experts at each area. In this case, they had literature and they had the humanities and they had um, industry and such, and they would have expert staff who could serve those areas. Um, the other thing is when you came in, Wheeler didn't want to take up the central hall with a big stair. He felt that was totally unnecessary and an expense they didn't have to keep up. So he tucked the stair kind of behind where the elevators are, as you can see, but he wanted to create this very openness, like you just could breathe fresh air of uh, coming in and, and very simplified, but, um, but, uh, but, but a sense that it's knowable. He, he really didn't want people to feel too overwhelmed. So there's always this talk about trying to create enough detail that it feels personable. Next slide. So the central hall became necessary because in order to get light, because it was a this was a this was a building was a half a block size. So it, it was interesting. This was little scratchings that Wheeler had done on the back of a letter to Githens, and um, and they had the uh, Tilden and Githens had done a library not that long ago um, in Highland Park, Michigan. And that's what that image is. So you can see it's almost like a splitting knockoff of what they ended up doing at the Pratt Library. But as you can see, the other thing is they there was always a concern about noise and how to how to keep not not allow too much noise to get around because it is a fairly open library, um, and and also sc scaling things. So there's a little um, the mural images that are in the upper band. Next slide. <laughs> Where I, we do luckily have a slide, a, a uh, rendering that Clyde Frizz did from his great great granddaughter, who was kind enough to make a copy of it for me, and it's shown in the lower left. 
there was a lot of conversation back and forth between the architecture firms about, you know, how do you style it? Clearly, Frizz is um, suggesting round columns. They ended up doing square columns. Uh, Frizz was very concerned it would be too much like a department store if it didn't have some kind of enclosure and, and scaling. And so there was a constant back and forth. Um, but the wonderful thing about having this large central hall is that it did allow for group um, meetings of, of, of the population in Baltimore. And the other thing that was really wonderful is the fact that this is one of the few places in Baltimore where you as an African-American could commingle with other people not of your race. It, there were not a lot of places in town. And so this was really a library for the people. Next slide, please. And this is my last slide, just to show you some of the specialized places that were created. Wheeler really wanted to try to make the library very efficient. And so he, he ruled out a lot of extraneous hallways. So he had the one corridor, major corridor, which you see an image to the right. And um, otherwise, a lot of it was reading rooms of which you could, you, you had lots of not, la wonderful natural light. There was also the advantage of the fact that the, the slope going down to the back allowed an entrance into a uh, children's area. And that's kind of a dowdy image step to the left. I love what they did it today. But you can see how I circled it in the plan where that sits. And on the other side, I think there was a magazine reading room, which you could also enter from the street. So the, the whole idea is that the specialized places were on the upper floor or the lower floor, but the but but most of the books people wanted to use was on the first floor to, to make it so easy to find and people know what they, where they're going. So that's all I had to share, but I, I, I just thought it really helped to pull all these images that the archives had um, because it's, uh, it's amazing what they did to put this library together. Sandra. Thanks, Jillian. <clears throat> so I think Jillian's talked a lot about the, the Pratt's role in the city. Uh, this, the image on the left shows the role that the Pratt Library plays in the neighborhood with its proximity to the Washington Monument, the Walters, the Peabody, the Unitarian Church that Mr. Pratt attended, and um, the Basilica of the Assumption directly across the street. So it really is a part of this cultural dis district in Mount Vernon. Since its beginning, the Pratt expanded, as you can see in the red footprint on the slide. Phase one of this project, which was completed quite a while ago in the early 2000s, was the annex edition, which sits above the Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. You can see that in the top right image on the slide. And then as part of this project, um, Gordon also asked that we restore and update the children's garden, <clears throat> which had originally opened in 2000, but was updated for the reopening of the renovated Central Library. And those images are on the bottom. This is a uh, photograph from the groundbreaking. <clears throat> I think it's really important to realize how many people it takes and how many institutions it takes to pull off a project of the size and complexity. Um, like the original building, this project had an architect in Baltimore, Air St. Gross Managing, and an architect in New York, Buyer Blender Bell were the leads. Um, the state funded the majority of the project represented here by Gov uh, Lieutenant Governor Rutherford. I worked directly for the Pratt, uh, represented by Board Chair Ben Rosenberg on the left, then CEO Carla Hayden, John Richardson, Chief of Facilities, along with a lot of uh, donors and board members. Um, Gilbane was the contractor and um, the city contributed, represented here by um, Stephanie Rowling Slate. A renewed, the renewed vision was one that really was focused on Pratt's long-term commitment to serving its customers. The photo on the left shows how they used to take books out into neighborhoods in a horse-drawn cart for those people who couldn't get downtown to get books. And then up until the time of the renovation, reference librarians would answer questions over the phone using the giant wheel, which was like a five-tier Lazy Susan of reference books. And then finally, with the renovation and the advent of 21st century technology, they've integrated their service into technology in many formats. Jillian kind of talked about this, but the building's organized into nine floors, three of which are the below grade closed stacks. And as she said, 
The posts that literally hold up the bookshelves also hold up the main floor of the library. Um, one of the goals for this project was to make it very easy for the users. So in the interim years, um, the complex but very precise Library of Congress cataloging system had been utilized to organize a series of what we might today call boutique collections. Instead, during this renovation, we agreed that it would be better to organize by the age of the user, with adults primarily focused on the ground floor and mezzanine, the teens um, receiving an incredible new wing up on the second floor, and the children receiving their space in the restored and very historic and lovely children's department on the lower level. These images show the first and mezzanine levels of the library. And the way we thought about organizing the collections within the library was kind of the way the human mind thinks. So we put business, science, technology, engineering, and math on the left hand or south side of the building, humanities, fine arts, um, fiction on the right hand side or the north side of the building. Straight ahead at number seven on the slide is the best in next department, which replaced the reference department because we really don't see those anymore. And that uh, was donated by the Hackerman family. At the second floor, you see outlined in red, the new Teen Learning and Leadership Center. It's um, a pretty incredible center. State-of-the-art learning um, spaces are provided there, all kinds of spaces, a self-sufficient suite, a reading room, two, class, uh, two classrooms, a hands-on creation station, a state-of-the-art recording studio and control booth, browsing stacks, clothes stacks, um, identified toilet rooms for the teens, and even a kind of sidewalk vending machine area for them. The little red box on the right-hand side shows the footprint for teens before the renovation. So you can see the increase in space for them was about 500%. This slide, uh, the upper slide shows the children's department on the lower level, which was expanded to include a variety of spaces, very much like the teen department. So they now have a technology lab, which is number five on the slide. They have the reading room, the historic reading room number two. Uh, the space number three can be divided into a creation station and a parent's place. So if there's something going on and a, another sibling is making noise, there's a space where the parents can go to quiet the younger child. There's a quiet study room for homeschoolers and um, also designated toilet rooms down there. We did restore the historic fish pond, which is a beloved memory of many Baltimoreans. So now we'll take a before and after tour of the library. On the left is um, what was then called Sights and Sounds with my personal favorite light fixtures. I'm very glad to see those gone from the building. And on the right, the image of the same space restored, I would say perhaps even beyond its original glory um, with custom LED fixtures based on original um, images and a variety of media available to the public, including devices on which to play the media if they don't happen to have them. Uh, the central hall image before the renovation and after looking toward the um, business science and tech, no, that's looking, I'm sorry, that's looking towards the humanities wing at the north. Uh, this is the business science and technology department before, and this is after looking in a different direction, but you can see the restored and expanded stacks. We learned that the public really does like to browse books, the restored details on the ceiling, and then some glass enclosed rooms in the distance that offer a variety of sizes for the public to meet and use. Uh, this is a view toward the second floor, toward the teen department prior and afterwards. So the teen department is contained behind that glass wall. We restored and remounted um, some sculpture that the Pratt had and brought that together to give a more gallery effect in the second floor corridor. This is the teen department before, and I promise you it's the same in room as this after. So this self-contained space with flat panels, the kids can connect to those in small groups to do things, variety of seating, a classroom behind the glass wall, 
There is visual oversight throughout the space. And again, custom light fixtures recreated from original images. A detail of the restored ceiling showing some of the birds, fish and fowl from the state of Maryland. That was an incredible effort. Uh, the creation station, which has highly flexible furniture so it can be reconfigured. Behind the wall on the right is the recording studio and control booth. This image is a group of students who were here being taught by one of the librarians how to use the collection. There are 3D printers, sewing machines, t-shirt machines, all kinds of things here available for teens because they wanted children to have access to those things they may not all have at home. This is not a space that the public saw, but it's one I routinely walked through when we were planning the renovation. It's a corridor that had been retrofitted with staff offices that were um, rather inadequate. We took that wall down, cleaned it up, made it into a staff collaboration zone with seating for group meetings, individual study, and even two fully enclosed uh, conference rooms outfitted with AV. And then finally, the children's department reading room looking back toward the garden and the fish pond. The next image turns toward the right, toward the entry with a custom screen designed to frame the entry and recalling some of the details from Central Hall designed by Byer Blender Bell, that screen. And then out finally into the lobby of the children's department where Art with a Heart collaborated with the Enoch Pratt and more than 400 people using 45,000 pieces of hand cut glass in 65 varieties to create this mosaic mural recalling the fish pond. And then we just wanted to note that it wasn't just the building, but also some of the furniture that was restored, including the trash can, tables and chairs. And this next image shows restored furniture up on the third floor in the Barbara Mikulski room. Senator Mikulski was kind enough to donate a lot of her artifacts to the Pratt upon her retirement from Congress. You can see here the beautiful restored furniture. You could not afford to buy that today. It can be readily combined with new furniture and still be successful. In this room, you can find things like uh, Senator Mikulski's Presidential Medal of Freedom and the first pen Barack Obama signed used to sign his first piece of legislation when he became president. Um, this is the Wheeler Auditorium, very much the way it was originally done, but fully updated, including new light fixtures that also distribute air, automatic window treatments, new seating, and a full new audiovisual system. So a very pleasant room now to watch movies or hear a speaker or some other kind of uh, performance. And then finally, a view of the Pratt at Twilight, the restored exterior of the building. And I think if you have questions, you're supposed to submit them by email because I believe we're out of time. Is there anything else? Nathan, do you going to wrap it up or? Oh, we, we, we have some time for Oh, uh, we do have time. OK. Yeah, yeah. And I, I see that we've, we've gotten some that have, um, that have come through. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Um, but well, one question that we had was um, was if the if the library has any of the discarded um, plans. Um, and as a comment of um, uh, William here, surprised that the architects didn't quit after so many changes to the. Uh, <laughs> to the you know, I will have to say that it, it was gut wrenching reading some of uh, what I saw because I also knew that they had both had a two and a half percent fee. That's it. And Wheeler at one point even tried to get uh, Tilton and Giffings to do the whole thing for just two and a half. Um, and said, could you bring in your own local architect with that fee? So that didn't that didn't fly. But they did do an immense and, and the library does have a lot of the holdings. Um, the, just like I showed you those elevations, they did have a lot of floor plans. I just chose to show the ones that were put in the in the uh, magazine since they were clean and could be shown at a small scale. I was actually thinking, and a lot of the architects in the crowd will appreciate this, that the the architects for the original building needed to write a tighter scope of work. <laughs> these days, you know, 24 versions, if you didn't plan for it in your fee, would be a pretty significant undertaking. And, and he had, they, they had Frizz, um, his, Nelson, I know they wrote, trying to get them to build a almost life-size model of the windows just to sort of figure them all out. 
So, I mean, they were really put to the paces. I do know that in 1930, they were, they got $57,000 in one lump, uh, must have passed a certain uh, period in their, in their work. Um, and I'm sure that came in handy because of the depression, um, but it still must have been painful every step along the way since they probably spent their, their fee. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an incredible work of art. So, um, and I do think the other thing that I just wanted to point out is that even though Til, uh, 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 Tilden um, Giffen's, you know, they might have had some of the over sweeping design. It, it really was as Frizz's firm that made sure every single detail came out because they were in charge of the construction drawings and, and every, you know, and, and there's that building down to the detail is so beautiful. And that's why the renovation is so gorgeous is they gave a lot of thought to that. And a question here from Esther is, how does the library handle natural daylight? Are there any strategies used to help with natural daylighting for reading? So most of the spaces have big generous windows as you see, and there are, um, you know, because daylight is a wonderful thing, but it can also be a challenge. There are all the way around the main levels, um, autumn, uh, window shades that will reduce the amount of light coming into the building, not eliminated at the ground floor, but those are controlled by, by libra librarians at the flip of a switch in back of house spaces. I do know that in the, in the right, they were, there was correspondence of trying to get the size right for the libra library windows on the lower floor and whether the light would stretch far enough back into the space. So they actually did look very closely at that because back when they built this, they were more reliant on natural light. I have a question here from Nancy, who was um, asking if Lonnie Bunch was in that groundbreaking ceremony. Um, it also um, was wondering um, why we don't see like the reference section of the library being as important anymore, making way for other kinds of, sp of spaces. Well, so I'm not a librarian and I could kick this to Gordon Krabby, I guess, but let me give it a shot. So we, they used to have all of the card catalogs and then there would be things like dictionaries and encyclopedias. And I'm gonna venture a guess that, you know, my iPhone here will do, I don't know, 8,000 times more <laughs> information in a much shorter time. And also um, I think the library has worked hard at enabling all of the librarians to answer questions so that if you're going in, it's like the single point of service, which I didn't really talk about, but if you're going into the library, you don't wanna stand in a line to ask a reference question and then stand in a line to check out a book. You wanna to go to a librarian and have that librarian help you, right? right. Yeah. Because no one wants to stand in a bunch of lines. Go ahead, Gordon. Yeah, I was just gonna suggest that uh, Sandra is absolutely right, but reference is still a big part of what we do. Uh, we answered over 1.1 million reference questions last year, but it's certainly uh, when we were thinking about this building and the physical space for that department, we found that technology and other means uh, were going to help us to meet the needs of our customers, and that's why the building uh, was reconfigured the way it was. And uh, the question here, um, if, if you can share any information about the ironwork in the building. About the iron, oh, the gates and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I, I, I can't talk a lot about it, but the original children's garden, when you entered from the street, did have decorative gates on it. And when we um, enclosed the children's garden, which as I said earlier, opened initially in 2000, we, at the demolition phase, we salvaged those gates and they were used on now the north side of the building. So if you walk down Franklin Street to the right in this image that you see on the screen, you can look as you start to pass between the, the two buildings, there's a setback between the original building and the annex. And above that is a quote from Frederick um, Douglass, once, once you learn to read, you will be forever free. And then also the gates into that space are the restored gates from the children's department. So Pratt was very thoughtful about wanting to reuse things. 
the existing decorative gates that were in the building around Central Hall before the renovation remained in place and were um, kind of updated a bit with new paint and a little bit of restoration work, but they were in fairly good condition and didn't need a lot of work. I hope that answers the question. I, um, I, I didn't get to the section that was on um, the metalworks in the historical records, but I do know that Wheeler was, he was tapping everybody and anybody. He, he was even tapping um, quarries about what kind of limestone they had. I mean, he, he, he had his, he didn't let anything um, go unturned. But the thing that ended up being the case, this was, this was the first really large open plan library that had been done and, and right there on the street. And it became the model for many afterwards. So it, it really was a showpiece. And, it, and, and, and he had to fight it because there were people who said, you cannot put it on the street. Oh, that's, that's undignified. I mean, it really was a controversial thing at the time, but he stuck to his guns and, it, and, yeah. and, the, and the beauty of it shows. He had an, he had a, he had an, Wheeler had an image in his mind that a woman or a mother pushing a pram should be able to enter the library from the main street. And of course, that is hugely significant in a world where the Americans with Disabilities Act rules architecture and design now, because not having to compensate for a grand stair entrance and allowing everyone to come in the front door just made the renovation that much easier along with the wide open spaces that Jillian discussed, it made the building that much more flexible and easy to adapt. Jillian, do you know who designed the metal work? I don't, but I mean, I am i haven't done going through the files yet. And, and when I get to that, Sandy, I'll let you know. I, I'm, I'm sure it's in there because he kept everything. I mean, he's a librarian and, and it's one of probably one of the best documented design processes of any building. Because of that, you don't usually have such records. So kudos to the library special collections to have kept it all and, and, and have it available to the public. And this is the last question that we have here. And I, Gordon, I think this one is for you, which is what happened to the news clippings and everything that used to be found in card files? I used to use them for family research. Well, I know that you could use your library card on the Pratt website access historic newspapers and do keyword searches, but do you have anything else to add to that? Well, um, you know, one of the things we try to do is preserve as much as possible. So where possible, we've digitized um, things. We've also uh, micro put things on microfilm, microfiche. Um, so we've tried to whatever, you know, sort of went away <laughs> with the, um, you know, dissolution of the card files. Um, is still a, still accessible, and um, our reference folks really they know how to get you to that material. And some of the old card files, Gordon, are still up in the Maryland department on the right. second floor of the annex. So if you're looking for something specific, um, go up to the Maryland department on the second floor and talk to the librarians there. They don't update those card files anymore, but the card files as of 2003. I mean, because we created new furniture to put the cards in. So there's a lot of those are still in place. And I see where uh, Linda talks about family research uh, that she was doing. And we have a very ro robust genealogy program and librarians highly skilled um, at assisting everyone. So, um, you know, that work continues. Yeah, and uh, the librarians at at the Pratt are, are excellent. Um, I, I totally recommend going to the Maryland room and, and doing some research there. It, there, it's it's an incredible, incredible resource. Uh, and with that, uh, I, I think that about wraps it up. And yeah, I encourage people to visit the, the Pratt uh, Central Library and see the renovation if you haven't already. It is, it is stunning. Um, uh, so fantastic work, Sandra and Gordon on, on making that happen. It's a, oh. it's, it's such a, it's a, it's really the crown jewel of the city. And I guess as we move into a post COVID world, let's hope the library will be able to get back to its robust uh, pro programs and events get calendar with a lot of speakers and other special events that they've just been hamstrung with for the past year and a half. So I'm hopeful that, you know, as we move forward in the world, everyone will get to experience the renovated Pratt the way it was meant to be done. 
Right. We uh, we were very hopeful um, to restore full hours within the next couple of months and to return to uh, the kinds of programming that people were used to, you know, pre-pandemic. Uh, this year will be a little bit of a hybrid year as, um, you know, we build that service, but um, we're hopefully on, on the road back. Okay, well, thank you, Gordon, Sandra, and Jillian. This was uh, fantastic. And remember, everybody, that we're off next week, but we'll be back on July 9th for a presentation on Historic Dundalk. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a nice Bye. weekend. Bye. <laughs>